Thank you very much for this uh, really inspiring session. And uh, now we move on to the session on mortality. Uh, uh, my name is Andreas Edel. I'm the Executive Secretary of Population Europe and will now guide you through this next session. Uh, before we start, uh, let me provide you some information about how you can interact with the speakers. You, you can insert uh, during the presentation your questions in the Q&A. And if you are a panelist, uh, please use the raise hand function so that we also can uh, call you up uh, then right in the in your order. Now, it's my very pleasure to introduce the first speaker to you. Uh, Georges Renier is a professor of demography at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine in the Population Studies Group, Global Population Studies in the 21st Century, Priorities and Challenges. And he will speak to us uh, today on mobile phone surveys for mortality surveillance in settings where GRVS are deficient. Josh, it's a pleasure to have you with us. The floor is yours. Uh, yeah. uh, thank you very much, Andreas. Uh, sorry, I need to need to needed to organize myself a little bit. Um, okay, uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, Andreas and Population Europe and the organizers <clears throat> of the forum uh, to give us an opportunity to speak uh, about mobile phone surveys for mortality surveillance. <clears throat> and I'm doing this on behalf uh, of a whole range of colleagues who are part of the RAMS uh, project consortium. So um, I want to start with um, giving you a recap of 2020 in case you still need that. Uh, but one of the things that we've learned from 2020 is that data is key to inform policy um, and to inform policy or government responses to mitigate um, the outbreak of the SARS uh, COV-2 uh, epidemic, or at least I should probably qualify that, that most gov to inform most governments' uh, uh, responses to uh, the pandemic, because not all governments have um, valued data and evidence uh, equally in that respect. But <clears throat> so we've seen an important um, um, proliferation in data dashboards and websites uh, reporting on uh, the number of uh, COVID-19 cases, the number of hospital admissions, uh, the number of COVID deaths on almost a daily basis. And that's really a remarkable uh, achievement by no means. But we've also learned from that experience that not all data is created equal. There is enormous heterogeneity in case definitions, for example, whether or not um, countries require a lab confirmed test uh, in order to label a case COVID case uh, and so forth. There are enormous differences in um, uh, testing coverage. There are enormous differences in the performance of uh, surveillance systems more generally. And as demographers, we also know that there are um, um, uh, real differences in population composition and these differences in population uh, composition directly factor into some of the statistics or if not most of the statistics that appear on these dashboards. So uh, in sum, I believe that we should acknowledge that uh, many of these headline statistics, uh, even though they are useful in some respects, but they are not comparable internationally. And in many um, uh, settings, they are only partial, give us only a partial picture of the outbreak. And so um, as a group, we have come to realize that uh, when it comes to mortality estimates, um, uh, excess mortality is usually a better metric for estimating or for quantifying the impact of the COVID-19 outbreak uh, in this particular instance. And um, excess mortality is usually defined in terms of the number or percentage of deaths above those that one would expect if COVID-19 were uh, uh, absent. <clears throat> the expected number of deaths in that, in that context is a counterfactual, a projected number, accounting for secular trends and uh, secular trends in mortality and season, seasonal variation, ideally. 
and on the illustrations that you see there on the left, the, the, the counterfactual is represented by the black dot uh, lines and the excess uh, deaths is represented by the, the areas in blue and in uh, red. These estimates of uh, excess mortality are based on all-cause mortality data derived from civil registration systems or mortality surveillance systems more generally, and they have the big advantage that they bypass um, uh, the heterogeneity in definitions, the heterogeneity in testing coverage, performance of surveillance systems that I mentioned earlier. In addition, they quantify both the direct as well as the indirect impact uh, of the COVID-19 outbreak in this particular instance. And with the indirect impact, uh, we are referring, usually referring to sort of the collateral damage that comes from uh, reductions in health services use or um, um, result or the downstream effects of the epidemic on the, on, uh, the population. Um, if it's done well, we can further disaggregate these estimates of excess mortality by uh, age and sex, and that allows us to, to account for differences between populations in com population composition uh, and make the estimates uh, more internationally comparable. In many settings, uh, our estimates of excess mortality are quite different from the uh, official uh, COVID-19 deaths, so to speak, um, uh, and that is illustrated quite clearly for those two countries that we have listed here, South Africa and uh, Egypt, where excess mortality has been quite uh, sizable and much, much, much far above uh, those that we would have seen on um, these in these headline statistics. The disadvantage perhaps of this types of estimates is that they are reported with some delay because it takes some time for um, death reports to be absorbed by uh, CRVS systems and then made uh, available for uh, analysis and publication. Now, I've shown you for I've shown you estimates for South Africa and Egypt, and that's no coincidence that I've taken these out as two examples from. Uh, Africa, because there are actually very few African countries with um, CRVS systems that are sufficiently performant uh, to track or sufficiently complete to track excess mortality estimates um, uh, more generally. And I should immediately also add that uh, despite the fact that um, uh, CRVS systems are currently um, uh, deficient in most uh, African countries. There are a number of initiatives and very encouraging initiatives to strengthen CRVS systems and mortality surveillance systems um, that uh, require our full support and are very promising. Now, where does this leave us when it comes to quantifying the effects of the uh, or the impact of the epidemic uh, uh, for uh, places, uh, countries in sub-Saharan Africa or low-income countries more generally, well, usually uh, we, we don't get very far with our current data systems. Um, our national level mortality estimates for uh, the region are still in large part derived from censuses and surveys, and these do simply not produce sufficiently timely data to address these questions that are at hand right now. Uh, censuses are typically, if all goes well, uh, organized every 10 years. Surveys may come at shorter intervals, but also uh, usually uh, spread apart three years or five years in time. So no timely uh, data are generated through these data systems. And in addition, um, a lot of the surveys were interrupted as a result, as a direct result of uh, the epidemic outbreak. So. The end result is sadly enough that our data systems are insufficiently performant to track uh, epidemic outbreaks or track the impact of crisis situations in many countries. Um, and that there is little evidence to inform policy responses and there is, and this may ultimately also have implications for resource allocation um, if we cannot document the magnitudes of the outbreak in some of these countries. And that brings us to uh, consider alternatives. Um, um, and one of the alternatives that I think we should consider more ex explicitly uh, going forward is the possibilities offered by 
uh, the rapid expansion of mobile phone ownership in the region and low income countries more generally. Uh, the illustration here on the left um, shows the percent of households in uh, sub-Saharan Africa with, or the trends in the percent of households in sub-Saharan Africa with a mobile phone and you know an estimate and these data come from the demographic and health surveys these data there's quite a, a big dispersion here um, so in in madagascar around 30 percent of the households had access or had a mobile phone a mobile phone a few years ago but some some other countries have uh, much 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 higher uh, penetration rates uh, think for example senegal with um, uh, mobile phone coverage of about eight, uh, above 90%, uh, Nigeria is not very far from that. Uh, the trends, uh, or despite this uh, heterogeneity, the trends in all these places are very similar, the rapid, rapid increase in mobile phone ownership, and that offers new opportunities for data collection. And in fact, the number of mobile phone surveys um, in the region has rapidly increased in the past and I've, I've copied here a couple of um, uh, references to reports that have been published uh, fairly recently, but unfortunately perhaps very little mobile phone surveys have actually tried to uh, deploy them or, or a very mobile, few mobile phone surveys have been used for tracking uh, mortality. There are a couple of smaller um, uh, subnational um, um, uh, projects uh, that make use of mobile phone surveys such as the SAPRAM network in South Africa um, or there have been a couple of uh, mobile phone surveys targeting mortality estimates uh, in the context of the Ebola outbreak but these are relatively small scale uh, efforts and not usually scaled up to the national level. And so that brings us to uh, a new project that we're just starting up right now um, uh, called the Rapid Mortality Mobile Phone uh, Surveys Project uh, with an objective to ascertain the feasibility of conducting mortality mobile phone surveys in five countries, Burkina Faso, the DRC, Malawi, Mozambique and uh, Bangladesh. And the intent is to conduct repeated um, cross-sectional surveys um, at a, with a national sampling frame um, um, over the next uh, 12 months or spread over 2021-2022. The interview modality uh, there is uh, a what is called referred to as computer assisted telephone interviewing. Uh, in practice that simply means that a live operator dials a number and conducts an interview uh, with the respondent. The samples uh, will be constituted through random digit dialing. Um, and so meaning that numbers will be randomly generated and we aim to conduct between 15 and 20,000 interviews uh, in each of these countries spread over 12 months. And sort of the, the 15 to 20,000 is sort of the order of magnitude that you need in order to obtain um, um, uh, reliable uh, mortality estimates. Um, in some of the countries, we will use a slightly different approach for sampling. So for example, in Burkina Faso, we will be uh, collaborating closely with the Institute of National Statistics to sample from uh, census households, uh, because the last census conducted in 2019 and early 2020 uh, collected the telephone number of household heads and we may uh, we will be collaborating with um, uh, the Institute of National Statistics to sample from that um, the census records. In Mozambique, we will uh, leverage another na nationwide mortality surveillance platform called COMSA and use that as a sampling frame instead of random digitizing or in addition to random digitizing. Uh, in addition to these uh, national level surveys, we will field a number of validation studies in settings uh, or smaller localities where other mortality surveillance systems are in operation. I'm thinking more specifically of uh, health and uh, demographic surveillance sites uh, that are in operation in several countries. And in Mozambique, of course, we will also uh, validate against uh, the COMSA estimates. Aside from that, we will also run a couple of pilot studies um, to evaluate different approaches for sampling. Um, some of them I already mentioned. 
um, to try out different interview modalities, working with live operators versus more automated uh, interview uh, modes, and also um, experiment with different variations in the survey questionnaire modules that we are using. Now, a couple of general considerations about mortality mobile phone surveys. Um, um, they're both um, uh, advantages and disadvantages to mobile phone surveys or phone surveys more generally. The, among the advantages is the fact that we don't need any in-person contact. And so, especially in the context of epidemic outbreaks or crisis situations, they're certainly safer than conducting face-to-face uh, -face interviews. They're cheaper than face-to-face -face, uh, interviews because they don't allow uh, the same uh, logistical operation um, to ship around uh, interviewers uh, around the country. Um, possibly there may be a more rapid turnaround between data collection and uh, the production or the publication of the estimates, or at least that's what we will be aiming for. And there are another, a number of other appealing aspects to mobile phone surveys uh, for data quality assurance uh, purposes. So we, there are several uh, call audit facilities available that we will try to leverage. Uh, and in, uh, another thing that I want to mention is that it's fairly easy to automate uh, respondent incentives for survey participation in terms of transferring mobile phone credits to the respondents upon the completion of an interview. Mobile phone surveys also have a number of important uh, disadvantages. Uh, one thing that I mentioned already is that we have to resort to uh, random digit dialing uh, because oftentimes there is no uh, satisfying sampling frame available and random digit dialing uh, can be quite resource intensive in its own right. Uh, further uh, surveys um, are uh, mobile phone surveys. The respondents' language in mobile phone surveys can be much less predictable than in the face to face setting because you dial a number randomly at anywhere in the country. And uh, some countries have several uh, languages that are uh, frequently spoken. So it's oftentimes difficult to predict which language the interviewer should speak to in order to conduct the interview. So certainly that will. Um, um, produce some logistical uh, complications of the fieldwork operation. Face-to-face -face surveys uh, uh, very often exceed one hour uh, as an average duration. Uh, of course, in the context of uh, a mobile phone survey, we need to try and keep the duration uh, of these interviews much, much shorter to keep, uh, to ensure the respondent uh, engagement and, and reduced uh, uh, refusals and dropouts and so forth. Uh, and that requires us to work with very short or shortened questionnaires compared to what we typically used to. Um, further, we have little control or the interviewers have little control over the circumstances in which the respondent uh, takes a call um, and that can produce some issues related to privacy uh, and so forth. Uh, mobile phone surveys also have typically very low response rates, which is certainly a concern when it comes to uh, analyzing the data. And finally, uh, mobile phones ownership is uh, unequally uh, distributed um, uh, across individuals. And uh, it's not only unequally distributed across individuals, but it's also um, uh, unequally distributed across characteristics that correlate with the outcomes that we would be interested in, in this case, mortality. And uh, so as an example of that, I've given here one um, uh, a graph that shows the correlation between the percent of women in a number of DHS surveys that own um, uh, a mobile phone and uh, under five mortality here on the y-axis and a clear negative correlation <coughs> is uh, visible uh, between these two factors. I should also add that once we start uh, disaggregating uh, by socioeconomic status groups, in this case, in this illustration here, we've done that by educational status, the correlation between mobile phone ownership and the outcome of interest uh, quickly dissipates or at least reduces, which suggests that we can statistically uh, account for that at the analysis stage, but it's certainly something that needs to be uh, dealt with uh, explicitly. 
what are sort of the survey instruments that we are planning to use uh, in this project? Uh, well, they're directly adapted from classical instruments uh, that are used in the context of a, typ a, a typical census or uh, surveys such as the DHS or the MIX. Uh, and these revolves around reports of deaths in the, in the household in the recent past, uh, pregnancy histories or, or birth histories that can be used for estimating under five mortality, sibling survival histories that can be used for estimating adult mortality, and per parental survival histories uh, that can be used for estimating old age mortality. And obviously, if we're dealing with uh, trying to estimate the impact of COVID, we should certainly also target old age mortality as a primary uh, outcome um, measure. And so here on the right hand side, I've shown you a couple of sample questions that we intend to use for measuring uh, old age mortality through a parental survival mod module. Uh, I mentioned earlier that we need to uh, keep the interviews as short as possible uh, when we're dealing with mobile phone interviews and um, that may um, require us uh, to shorten some of the questionnaires uh, and that's certainly something that we will uh, pilot and uh, try to validate, for example, inferring a relative's age from the respondent's age rather than asking uh, for the age of each of the relatives individually. One of the appeals uh, of this type of uh, instruments for estimating mortality is that they produce retrospective reports of mortality, uh, meaning that they produce both a baseline estimate uh, as well as an estimate for a period that could be uh, affected by possible excess mortality um, uh, and therefore also um, directly produce excess mortality estimates. Uh, in addition to sort of the, the, the core mortality modules, we will certainly also include uh, questions about background characteristics of individuals. We are exploring whether or not we can include questions about symptoms to attributes death, deaths to a, a specific uh, set or a limited set of uh, causes that may be of interest. And there may be other ad hoc modules that could be added to the surveys uh, if the need is there to do that. Well, was, will this work, these mobile phone surveys for tracking mortality? We don't know. Uh, the, the field work has not yet started. We are expecting the first results towards the end of the summer or the early fall. Uh, but I, in the next couple of slides, what I wanted to do is uh, show a couple of uh, illustrations from some pilot work um, uh, that uh, we've been doing with a couple of colleagues in Malawi. And uh, in essence, what we did there was uh, interview sets of siblings um, and one sibling interviewed in person, another sibling interviewed over the phone and that allows us to compare uh, some um, uh, basic statistics uh, for these two interview modalities. Here on the left hand side we show the time that is necessary to collect uh, information about maternal survival uh, and uh, these questions can be very or these survey modules are very very short these questions or this information can be collected under under uh, uh, one minute uh, per parent uh, in most circumstances and there are, there are no big differences between in-person interviews and mobile phone interviews here on the right hand side, we show the proportion of missing values on a key indicator that may be that uh, uh, may be necessary, for example, maternal age. Uh, here we find that the number of missing values between the mobile phone uh, interview and the in person interview is not very different. In fact, it was uh, even slightly lower in the mobile phone uh, interview context. Um, these two plots here, uh, again, uh, compare uh, the consistency uh, between um, the two interview modalities. Uh, on the left hand side, we uh, show the consistency in the reporting of maternal age uh, in an in-person interview and uh, through a mobile phone interview. And the correlation between the two reports is uh, quite high, over 75%. Um, and on the right hand side, we uh, report on the consistency um, or the correlation in terms of the time that has elapsed since the death of the mother in case she had uh, died 
and again, the consistency in the reports between the two siblings, between the two interview modalities is uh, quite high or quite encouraging, over 90% uh, correlation here. So in conclusion, uh, we believe that uh, mortality mobile phone surveys are a promising interim solution or a promising stopgap uh, in the absence of more performant uh, civil registration systems or mortality surveillance systems uh, more generally. Um, um, but obviously there is a need for field testing, there is a need for validation studies, there is a need for a description of best practices in terms of sampling approaches, the questionnaire modules to be used, the interview modalities and so forth. If it works, there will certainly be applications uh, to inform policy response towards epidemic outbreaks, uh, possibly other crisis situations, but there may also be applications uh, in complement to the more traditional data collection systems, uh, thinking here of uh, the typical surveys such as the DHS or the mix, uh, censuses and possibly also other mortality surveillance systems. So that's where I want to leave it for now. Let me just acknowledge uh, our funders and also my collaborators in this project. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, George, for this uh, interesting insight in what you are planning to do with, uh, with the mobile phone service. Uh, one of the many experiences which we had in the COVID-19 pandemic is that uh, the advice which we were expected to give policymakers what to do uh, were hard to be given uh, due to the lack of data and uh, uh, a lot of advice was given without sufficient data and uh, so i think it's really important what you are going to do particularly also as you said in your, your last remarks uh, with regard to future crisis whatever this may be uh, to have such tools at hand and not to first to have to build them up so many thanks for this very insightful talk i i would suggest that we now follow immediately up with the next talk and then put together all your questions and and uh, uh, comments uh, in the q a section afterwards um, again if you already have now questions uh, please uh, use the q a button at the bottom of your screen and write in your, your question and, uh, and if you're a panelist, raise your hand. So it's my pleasure to announce the next speaker in, in this uh, section and it's uh, Samuel Clark. Uh, Samuel Clark is a professor at the Department of Sociology at the Ohio State University in Columbus. And he will give a talk on global population studies in the 21st century priorities and challenges. Samuel, we are very looking very much forward to your talk. Please take the floor. Uh, thank you very much. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Thank you for, for that uh, introduction. And um, thank you for inviting me to this. And thank you to everyone who's uh, made time to come and see. So I'll just um, add a couple things to my, my nano bio and then start off with my talk. So like, um, uh, like you said, I'm a professor at the Ohio State University. I do work in demography and epidemiology and uh, uh, more uh, recently in statistics. Um, this is relevant to the talk I'm about to give. I was born in Kenya and I grew up in East Africa. My parents are American. So I have a, a mixed identity sitting exactly halfway between the global north and the global south. And most of my career I've spent uh, working on topics that affect uh, Africa. At this point in time, I work on statistical and computational methods. Uh, for characterizing the burden of disease in areas without traditional vital statistics systems, mathematical models for age-specific mortality, and methods to improve coverage and accuracy of mortality estimates. And if you're interested in any of those things, there's some, some additional information on my website. However, today I'm not going to talk about any of the um, detailed methods work. I'm going to um, <clears throat> try to do something at a, a much higher level and talk about what I think is the primary um, challenge going forward with the uh, mortality um, uh, measurement, estimation, and interpretation in the global south, and um, what I think might be the, uh, the long-term solution to some of these issues. So I'm going to structure this talk around these very simple questions uh, relating to uh, mortality in the global south. Why? Why are we interested in it? Why should we care uh, a lot about mortality? Um, what is it exactly? Uh, where should we care about it? 
um, who are the actors involved and which are the ones we should uh, possibly focus on, uh, how do we do this, and when. So if we start off uh, with the why, um, this is just uh, recapping what I'm sure all of you know very well, uh, but mortality is, is absolutely essential for understanding uh, health, for monitoring the, um, the health situation of a given population, how it changes through time, how it's distributed across uh, different characteristics of the population and space. We do this by looking at overall risks and differentials, and very importantly, by uh, attempting to uh, get a picture of the causes uh, leading people to die uh, before uh, they optimally should. And obviously, looking for changes, um, uh, usually uh, dominated by time and place. Very importantly, the next level then is to look at equity, to look at it through a slightly different lens and attempt to understand uh, why we see the differentials that we do, um, usually around social dimensions. So we look for differentials in the risk of dying, years of life lived, lived and uh, years of healthy life lived. Finally, closer to what I normally do, we look at um, uh, population structure and dynamics and mortality plays a key role in um, developing the age structure. And it's a, a fundamental component of anything we want to do in terms of estimating what happened in the past with respect to population dynamics and of course forecasting into the future. And at this point in history, the, um, the uh, sustainable development goals are an important framework that wraps up um, a number of mortality indicators and provides a um, a very immediate and um, significant incentive uh, that's measured by those mortality indicators. So on to the, the question of exactly what uh, uh, we're, we're interested in with respect to mortality. So obviously we're interested in measures. Um, as demographers, minimally we break these down by sex, age, time, and place, risks of dying, lifespans, causes, and ultimately the burden of disease if we can um, get the cause information. What also include, pr includes processes? If we move beyond the, the academic study of mortality and think about trying to affect the, the risks of dying and bring more equity to the situation, then we have to talk about processes that are um, part of the, the larger um, society and the institutions that we, we all share. So we have measurement systems, we have uh, the census, we have vital statistics systems, we have all kinds of new systems beginning to develop, uh, especially in the global south. Those measurement systems produce data, how that data uh, is managed, um, who has access to it, where it is, uh, what kind of processes are used to in, inform the quality of the data and produce results um, are critical. We, of course, um, apply methods to these data. As demographers, we love um, methods and we have a large toolbox. Uh, some might argue that demography is defined as a field by its methods. And um, very key, uh, right at the end here, we have reporting systems. We have to move those um, insights and new knowledge that we gain from uh, characterizing mortality into uh, the hands of people who can do something about whatever the uh, issues are we discover. And Georges just uh, described um, a um, very topical example with respect to COVID-19 and the fact that pretty much all of these systems, um, including the reporting system, um, uh, require some additional thought and uh, investment, especially in the global south, but in, in the case of COVID-19, even in the global north. So where are these issues particularly important? Um, I'm going to make the bold statement that the global north has this under control pretty much. Um, that's not strictly true, but in a comparative sense, um, it's definitely uh, more or less true. The global south, on the other hand, is a, a very complicated situation with much to be done. And what I'm about to argue is particularly in Africa. So here is, is the point that I really want to make in this talk, um, because I think it's a um, shocking statistic and one that should motivate a wide range of um, very fundamental activities to uh, bring it more into line. So roughly 60% of global deaths are not registered at all. Uh, this is um, a figure that, that is published by Mickelson et al. Uh, in 2015 in their comprehensive review of uh, civil registration and vital statistics systems globally. And of the 40% or so that are registered, 
uh, many do not get an accurate cause. So here we have, as a global reality, the fact that the majority of deaths that happen on this planet do not uh, get registered in, in any sense, and likewise don't get included in the um, uh, kind of data collection and processing and um, study that we do as academics. We do all kinds of things to get around this fact, but this fact underlies uh, the actual situation. So I want to just look at this a tiny bit more. Um, Mickelson et al. in their publication uh, calculated something called the Vital Statistics Performance Index, which is a single number that captures um, six dimensions of um, the overall um, uh, vital statistics system in a given country. And then they did this for all countries and produced a nice map that we'll see on the next slide. So it's wrapping together completeness of death reporting, the quality of that death reporting, level of cause specific detail uh, with respect to the causes, internal consistency of the data produced by a system, quality of age and sex reporting, and data availability and timeliness. And here we have a global picture of that index. Um, and I have to say, this, is, this figure is uh, very good. And then uh, it's a little study in, in data visualization um, that could be improved. So the color index that we have over here uh, on the left uh, indicates that reddish pinkish colors uh, correspond to low values of our index. In other words, countries uh, where much improvement could be made. Um, as we move into greener colors, things get better. Uh, and then, strangely enough, uh, the very best are in a bluish turquoise color. So if we look at the Americas, North America is in that blue turquoise color. We move to South America, we see a lot of green and a little bit of red. If we look around Europe um, and Asia, we see Europe with a lot of blue and green. We see Asia uh, with a, a fair amount of red. Of course, Australia is in our turquoise color. And then we come to Africa where we see uh, a lot of red and a lot of white and a tiny bit of green. And the white corresponds to no data. So in other words, they were not able to calculate uh, that index value for all of these countries uh, that appear to be in, um, in white. So that's the, the global picture. It very quickly focuses us uh, on Africa, parts of Asia, a little bit of Latin America, and indicates that um, there is uh, very much improvement that can be done to produce the foundational information that we need to understand uh, mortality. So what I wanna do in the rest of this talk is um, be relatively optimistic and um, relatively bold in uh, what I think are ways that we should collectively uh, as um, individuals and institutions that are interested in population uh, studies and global health, uh, how we should kind of move forward to try to address these, um, well, that particular big problem. But I think it wraps up um, um, big problems that we have with um, conducting global health in Africa in particular and the global south in general. So I think we need new thinking. And in particular, we need to think about who. Who um, should um, be primarily engaged in um, developing the solutions to this problem into the future? And I know this has been said many times by many people, but I think it's worth reiterating that um, we have a structural imbalance where uh, a lot of the innovation and um, um, more sophisticated analy analytical work on these topics is done in the global north. Um, I really strongly um, hope that we can find a way to create another poll for this kind of work, uh, a poll that exists in the global south. So we kind of move the center of gravity of activities that primarily affect the global, global south uh, in population studies and global health. We move those uh, gradually or as rapidly as possible to the global south, south itself. So we take the activities that we're all familiar with in Vienna, New York, Rostock, Seattle, and other places, and we increasingly do those things in Nairobi, Dakar, Addis Ababa, Johannesburg, maybe Buenos Aires. So this really um, requires that we create new human capital in the global south. And I think um, that the, the way to do this, and I'm going to show you a couple examples in a minute, is to do it in place in the global south, to kind of reverse this tradition that we've had for many decades of bringing people from the global south to train in the global north, 
and then um, um, hope that they um, go home and can uh, function to, to do this kind of work in the global south. So of course, creating human capital, it's training, it's apprenticeships, it's mentoring, and many um, other activities uh, that surround these. Uh, but without infrastructure, none of this is going to um, uh, really have a big effect. So we need to address um, the uh, comparative uh, lack of infrastructure as well. And especially as we're moving into um, this point in history where we have big advances in computation, big advances in um, uh, methods and uh, huge new possibilities in terms of data. We need the infrastructure to take advantage of those things. So data repositories, computing, data collection systems. And here, I'm gonna talk a little bit more about this later, data amalgamation. I think something new that again, many people have talked about before, but I want to mention it again. Something new is that we have different sources of data from what we had in the past. We have the traditional sources of data. Now we need to figure out how to bring them all together. Um, into something that's usable and uh, timely and makes up for the fact that we can't use some traditional uh, systems um, in, in the global south at this point in time. So uh, how? Um, back to um, human capital. We need that human capital uh, development to enable uh, substantial in-place innovation. So my thought is that um, the promise of the future given all of the advances that we have here, is that uh, uh, we need to produce innovations that bring them all together. And those innovations need to increasingly happen in the Global South, directed by uh, people living there uh, and people who will um, have to live with the consequences of whatever uh, happens in the Global South. So we need to take advantages of, uh, of all of these new developments in data and computing and methods, and then develop uh, novel approaches to putting them all together. So data, uh, I'm going to emphasize data several times now. Um, I've spent most of my life doing exactly what I'm saying is not a good thing to do in this point. Um, that is using sophisticated models um, and um, computational tricks and things to infer, interpolate, extrapolate, and generally make informed guesses about what's really happening at specific points in time and specific places to specific groups of people. That has been a very pragmatic approach given the lack of data that we do have, but I would argue it is uh, not a good uh, strategy in general and not one that we should be satisfied to uh, continue with uh, into the future. Um, <clears throat> so I think we need to um, focus on um, data itself, generating um, good data um, using innovative approaches. George just went through the mobile phone approach. Uh, I think it's an excellent example of something that takes advantage of where we are technologically at this point in history. Um, it has lots of potential upsides and very many uh, potential downsides as well. But what I don't want to do is um, look at some of these new things and say, ah, they're not going to work because um, you know, there's this laundry list of potential limitations. What I think we need to do is address those limitations and um, move forward enthusiastically um, and uh, um, do that on multiple fronts so that we um, eventually generate a stream of data sources that are tightly connected to reality, not through a string of models, but to, to an actual reality and um, are produced in a timely way that can feed into uh, the SDGs and other um, development exercises. So in terms of innovation, um, to get the most of, of these new data sources, we need new approaches to collecting data. We need to develop new sources themselves. We need the data amalgamation that I've mentioned just now. Um, we need to uh, put a focus on making things timely, so speeding things up uh, in, in an uh, important way. And as I've mentioned a couple times now, um, new methods development to make all of this happen. So now I want to move to um, a couple case studies of what I think are um, um, old ways of doing things and new ways of doing things that uh, are very promising. So an old way of doing things, I think, is the Institute of Health Metrics and Evaluation, IHME, in Seattle. This is a um, institution firmly rooted in the global north. It's a privately funded institution um, that essentially is able to uh, do whatever it uh, wishes to do 
Um, it essentially is um, a health intelligence data warehouse. It uh, characterizes the burden of disease, produces population and um, population health estimates and forecasts and much, much more. With respect to the Global South, there's very little human capital development or transfer um, of that to the Global South. It's not a particularly transparent organization, so it's difficult to figure out um, exactly how its uh, modeling framework transforms data into uh, results. But it's highly influential with respect to the Global South because it is one of the very few comprehensive sources of health and population uh, data. And it's very well connected to Global North funders, um, publishers, and also to the WHO. So uh, apart from being key data providers and consumers of its product, it's hard for me to see how the Global South plays an important role in the workings of IHME. So my opinion, very much my own personal opinion, is that the world needs to move on from this type of model. Possible remedies um, in, a, in a big sense are to replicate elements of IHME, which I think um, there are many very useful features of what they do and how they do it, but replicate those um, in the Global South so that they happen there, they're directed by um, the Global South itself and are more connected with uh, multilateral organizations that uh, include the Global South. Uh, and of course, uh, requires building human capital and infrastructure uh, that are necessary to do the kinds of things that IHME does, but do that in the South so that those um, resources exist there. Now I want to move to uh, what I think um, is a good example of how um, together as a community of the, of the South and the North, we can uh, move to uh, accomplish some of these things. So I want to talk about the Af African Population and Health Research Center, APHRC, um, which was uh, directed by um, Alex Eze, who spoke earlier today um, for quite a, quite a long time. So this is an Africa-led um, research and um, capacity development and uh, policy um, Institute in Nairobi and now in Dakar, Senegal. Uh, it specializes on topics concerning population health, um, looking at, at the whole sequence of activities from um, developing hypotheses, collecting data, doing the analysis, uh, the research part, the publishing, and through all the way to the, to the um, uh, policy engagement. Uh, all of those things happening um, uh, conducted uh, in, in the South and directed by um, folks in the South and extremely effective, um, growing very rapidly, uh, very high impact and very much um, fulfilling the need to develop human capital uh, in the Global South. Now, APHRC has lots of Global uh, North partners, um, lots of funding coming from the, the Global North, but funding coming from, from other sources as well. So, I think, uh, and it's it's not brand new. It's been going on, uh, I think, since the late late '90s. Um, so this is a a wonderful example of how that um, human capital creation um, can happen in the South, uh, stay in the South, and respond to the needs of the South in a very uh, constructive and useful way. Another example is the uh, Consortium for Advanced Research and Training in Africa, CARTA. Uh, this is an organization closely aligned um, with uh, APHRC, but it's um, a consortium of African universities that conducts um, a range of uh, training programs, advanced training programs, uh, PhDs and masters, um, and uh, very much facilitates the creation of human capital in the global south, and um, does so in a way that um, forms networks and uh, provides the kind of support that um, early career and young people need to ensure that they uh, launch successful careers and are, um, be, you know, become useful academics and um, public health and population researchers. So I think I mentioned all of those. Um, those are my two examples of things that are functioning well, uh, being very productive and accomplishing the, uh, the goals that I laid out a little earlier. And just to remind you that Alex has been um, uh, very um, importantly involved with creating both of these. 
So the future, a couple thoughts on, on how to move forward with this. So using those two examples, APHRC and CARTA is, as examples, I think that we should um, support the building of um, uh, in-place human capital development and research capacity in the Global South. Um, this requires the Global North to continue funding uh, these kinds of activities, but not necessarily controlling them. Um, and um, one option for doing this is, is, as I mentioned near the beginning of my talk, maybe instead of students from the Global South coming to train in the Global North, we kind of reverse that uh, idea and we have researchers and instructors in the Global North uh, move in the other direction and spend some time doing their work and um, teaching and mentoring uh, in Global South institutions. I also think that beyond the human capital development element, focusing on data itself um, instead of models uh, is something that we should prioritize. And then beyond that, I think um, encouraging the rapid um, innovation in, in methods to utilize new data sources, new computational methods and so on uh, is a, uh, a, a key element of, of a, a successful future here. So we need the, the old data sources, we need censuses, we need vital statistics systems, we need to continue um, making efforts to develop traditional vital statistics systems. But in the meantime, we need to do uh, other things to provide the information that they are uh, unable to provide right at the moment. We need to keep up with the surveys, um, DHS surveys and many other household surveys that uh, traditionally happen in these places. And um, research surveillance systems, such as health and demographic surveillance, the new data sources, big data, digital exhaust, uh, remote sensing, and um, old but uh, rejuvenated methods like verbal autopsy for ascertaining uh, cause of death. And just here, I want to end with uh, a couple examples of uh, some of these innovations. Uh, these are things I've worked on, so I uh, have to acknowledge that. Um, we have thought about combining things in a, in a principled way. So we've um, uh, created uh, something that we call HIAC, which combines sample surveys with health and demographic surveillance so that we can leverage the strengths of both of them. The coverage that you get with a large sample survey and the detail that you get with a um, health and demographic surveillance system site. So by putting to them together, uh, we've outlined one way that you could leverage the detail of the surveillance system to uh, create a sampling system, which is um, focused on households that are likely to experience a rare event. Uh, so you kind of uh, adjust your sample to do the best job it can at capturing all of the events you, um, you want to capture and then account for that purposeful sampling uh, when you calculate your indicators. This greatly improves performance of the, the overall hybrid system, covers a large population, uh, and saves resources. Another thing we've worked on in this area is uh, spatial temporal small area estimates of under five mortality using existing surveys and censuses. And um, this leverages existing data, but uh, creates a new way of processing those data or analyzing them um, to fill in the gaps in both time and space, um, or said in another way, uh, greatly improve the disaggregation by space and time, something that the SDGs are uh, very much focused on. And then finally, what I spend a great deal of my time working on is verbal autopsy, an interview-based approach to ascertaining cause of death, comparatively cheap and uncomplicated, um, feasible, uh, can be integrated into large-scale mortality surveillance, such as CRBS systems, and provides a reasonable estimate of the important burden of disease indicators. But like the telephone interviewing that uh, George went over, verbal autopsy has um, a long list of, of, of strong uh, limitations and weaknesses. So it's a good example of um, a, an approach that I think is um, feasible, um, addresses one of the key uh, holes in the mortality data, that is the cause of death. Um, but needs a lot of methodological innovation to make it um, really useful to fully convert its potential and to um, make it function at a scale that's uh, useful um, going forward. And I think that's where I'm going to stop. So thank you for listening. Yeah, thanks a lot, Sam, for this really great overview and also inspiring um, um, insights on uh, how we can, on the one hand side, 
really uh, work on data literacy and education of, of uh, uh, good experts who can, can deal with these things. And on the other side, also to give us better instruments um, in terms of data service and others. Um, there is already one question, and I would like to invite also the, the colleagues in the uh, audience and, and the, and the panelists. When you would like to, uh, to uh, uh, answer a question or give a comment, please use the Q&A section. Or if you're a panelist, please raise your hand so that I can uh, call you up in, in the order of appearance. So the first question from the floor is uh, from Daniel Goodkind. Uh, great presentations. On Sam's suggestion to focus on investments in new data rather than modeling, what are your thoughts about the potential cost benefits of each approach? Sam, I think this question was on, on to you. Yeah, so I'll respond. So I, I think the time frame for this thought about cost and benefit is the, the key element. So in the very short time frame, uh, obviously we need to continue with the modeling efforts because there's no other option. Um, but the argument I want to make is that over a medium or a longer time frame, then the, the, the calculus switches completely. If we invest a, in human capital development, we will have in place a, um, a set of individuals who are much better um, able and placed to address the problems that affect the populations that they live in. So I think it's a, a nuanced affair. It's a, it's a gradual shift, but if we don't commit ourselves now or sometime soon to creating this human capital, then we're never going to get to uh, the place where we need to be, uh, where uh, you know these activities are, are, are led in the global south, where they um, relate to the global south. See no questions from the floor so far. So we this morning we heard a very uh, inspiring talk by uh, Emilio Zagini about uh, the potential use of uh, social media data. And uh, Sam, you mentioned that. Um, um, uh, so actually, there's a question to both of you. Do you think that in the fields you are interested in, uh, in and where you are looking in, is is matching with social media data? Is that a, a promising approach? And uh, why do you see restrictions or limitations? Sam, would you like to start? Sure. Yeah, I am familiar with uh, Emilio's work, and I uh, think it's fantastic. Uh, and it allows us to do a bunch of things um, that we otherwise wouldn't be able to do. Uh, I, th I think it fits perfectly in what I'm talking about as innovation. So in, in the Global South, in Africa in particular, these traditional sources of information, say to study migration, uh, aren't there. Um, and we need to turn to innovative things like social media, you know, cell phone uh, call records, um, um, you know, potentially looking at that in conjunction with remote sensing and surveys and the census, putting all those things together to do, uh, try and get a picture of what we need to do. And that's why I think the human capital part is so important because those are um, complicated tasks that they require new thinking, they require new methods. And um, yeah, my strong feeling is they should be done by, by people in those areas rather than being done in uh, London or Seattle. Mm. <laughs> Josh, have you some thoughts on that? Uh, how can help social media also in your case? I mean, it's a, a different thing, but uh, maybe you have some experience. Uh, no, I personally don't have any experience, but I fully support Sam's comments about this. Um, um, there are opportunities, just as cell phone use is increasing rapidly, smartphone use is increasing rapidly, mm -hmm. um, social media use is increasing increasing rapidly um, uh, all over the world. Um, and there are opportunities there and we need to leverage them. We have a comment from, uh, from the floor, from uh, Sunita Kishor. Uh, for phone interviews for mortality, uh, does it matter who the respondent is, household head or women themselves? Often women are not the ones who have the cell phones or control them. So a very important question. Josh, would you like to answer? Yeah, um, uh, yes, indeed. And it will depend a little bit on um, uh, the type of mortality information that you're after. If you're looking uh, to estimate child mortality, ideally you would be speaking with women of reproductive age. If um, you're um, uh, after estimating old age mortality, ideally you would be speaking with um, older adults themselves uh, beyond the age range that is very typical in 
the classical demographic uh, surveys. Probably you want to go uh, uh, also interview individuals who are themselves age 60 or uh, 65, such that you can uh, estimate uh, really old age mortality from uh, reports on the survival of parents who are typically 25, 30 years older than the respondent themselves. Um, so uh, yes, it is very important to whom you speak to and uh, phone ownership is unequally distributed by gender, by age, and that needs to be taken into account when you design these studies. Mm -hmm. uh, absolutely agree. Okay, don't see any other questions from the floor. So uh, thanks a lot to both uh, presenters uh, to give us such an interesting insight in your work and overview.